Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're back to talk more Flames hockey. But before we do, we just want to start the show off uh, with a note for Flames fans. Former Flame Chris Simon, who was with the team during their 04 run, sadly passed away at age 52 this week. Uh, Chris Simon, a big part of that run, played 85 uh, regular season games and just over uh, 20, 22 playoff games for the Flames between 03 and 05 and 06. He didn't play the 04 05 season when there was a lockout. Matt, it really sucks to see a guy like this uh, going so early. Yeah, and it's difficult when you know a player has personal issues that led to uh, his passing, and it just it's an unfortunate situation all the way around. I remember Chris Simon, when they brought him in, I was excited because he was really, I mean, as much as that cast of Flames uh, players in that 3 4 season was really a bunch of nobodies, you could argue that he was probably one of the biggest names in that team. Like, he'd been around the league for a while, everyone knew his name. Do you remember what the Flames gave up to get him? I know Noodles was a part of that, but the draft picks and other things, not quite so All much. All right, on March 6th, 20, 2004, so almost... Uh, Pretty much, you know, 20 years to the day, almost. Um, the Calgary Flames give up Blair Betts, Jamie McLennan, and Greg Moore for Chris Simon and a 4 seventh rounder that ended up being some guy named Matt Schneider. Yeah, so... I could uh, see any one of those guys for Simon in a seventh being a reasonable package, but, like, Blair Betts, Noodles, and I don't know who Greg Moore is, but those two guys together seems like the Flames overpaid. Well, Blair Betts was nothing more than like a 13th forward anyway, so... But you could argue, I mean, that's where Simon was for most games as well, right? Yeah, and, you know, realistically, Lynn Loins and uh, him and uh, Betts were that kind of filler depth guy uh, heading into the trade deadline, so the Flames just needed to upgrade the last line on that team, and, you know... Getting rid of your third string goalie and, you know, a player that's not going to be in your lineup for Simon was an excellent move. And uh, he scored the first goal for the Flames in the Stanley Cup Finals in Calgary. So he had definitely had an impact throughout the playoffs. Yeah, still a fan favorite to this day, right? When you look back at that team and you think about the guys on that team, still one of the favorites. And a lot of people forget there, but he was one of two enforcers. Most teams had one. The Flames had him and they had Oliwa, Christoph Oliwa, and the two of them together. Um, you didn't see that kind of, I guess, firepower on one roster very often. No, and, you know, you got to beat him on the score sheet and in the corner, too. <laughs> yeah, and for those that don't know, Chris Simon went on to play all the way up till 2012-2013. Uh, he played for about six seasons in the KHL, even being a captain of a team over there, which is awesome. So his career kept going. Um, Chris Simon will be will be missed by the Sea of Red. Yeah, uh, just lousy situation. Yeah, but, and, you know, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about what happened or didn't happen or, you know, how Chris passed away. We'll let fans read about that on their own. But I think the more we see guys passing away young like this, I think the more that it makes me hope the league and the Player Association really do some hard thinking about CTE and how we're taking care of players when they uh, retire and that sort of thing. Yeah, and it's not just hockey. Like soccer has the same issues. Uh, rugby, football, uh, you know, any game that has contact with the head at all, it's you know, it, it all of the leagues. Like especially as um, science learns more about how the brain works and operates, uh, you know, things just have to be tweaked and changed as more information gets more commonly known and you know because you don't want to see people continue to get problems like this moving forward nope well i was about to say let's move on to a happier topic but not a happier topic unfortunately looking back at the week that was for the flames they played only two games which is un unusual for the flames monday and saturday there's another game that'll take place uh, later today as we record on sunday both of them big losses, a 5-2 loss to the Capitals and a 4-2 loss to 
Vancouver. So let's start with that Capitals game, Matt. Um, Ovechkin scores twice. The uh, Capitals to beat the Flames for their third straight win. Ovechkin didn't look great at the start of the season, but he's starting to pick it up. Yeah, and he's been on a tear even since then. Like, he even scored two earlier today. Eight in his last five games, including today's games. And uh, when Ovi's on a heater, those pucks find the net. And, you know, no matter how good Wolf is, uh, yeah, the, when he's on, it does not matter. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Dustin Wolf played this one. Dan Vladar backing him up here. You know, I thought... Wolf played well in this one, but I think this was a great adversity game for Wolf. I mean, when you're taking on Ovi or taking on Sid or taking on any of those guys that are in the top echelon to see what your kid has got against them, I think that's really a good measuring stick for Dustin Wolf. Yeah, and it, he needs to learn how to play against that, those kinds of teams as, as he takes his next steps into becoming a starting goaltender in the NHL and he didn't play badly against the Capitals, even though he gave up four goals. Uh, there was not really much he could have done on any of the four goals. You know, uh, the defense for the Flames at times was rather uh, suspect and allowing too good of players too much time in wide open spaces. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of those. They just watch them go right for the yeah, net. It's like, oh... That's my guy. Oh, okay. Well, sorry, dude. Bye. I'm going to the bench. <laughs> and uh, the Flames had a couple days after that one to think about that game. Came back Saturday night, Hockey Night in Canada against the Canucks um, in Vancouver. This was the first time that really we saw um, Lindholm and Kuzmenko against their former teams. And the Flames dropped another one, 4-2 against the Canucks. They got down early. They were down, what, like a minute into the game? and never really managed to fight back. Yeah, I thought they played really well against Vancouver and certainly a better effort than against the Capitals and were pretty much in it throughout the contest. They just couldn't find that equalizing goal. And there's and a streak there in the third where they were getting a lot of good shots on. Yeah, and if not for uh, the uh, Casey DeSmith uh, putting up a good performance, uh, the Flames might have... Uh, tied the game and send it to overtime, but uh, power play goal late and then an empty netter and then the Flames responding with Joel Hanley's goal all coming in like the last six minutes of the game uh, sealed the deal and you know, but the score definitely was not indicative of the game. It was a fairly even contest, which Considering Vancouver is the best team in the NHL, that's a fairly decent performance by the team. Yeah, I thought they looked a lot sharper here than they did in the last couple, not just that Washington game. Um, I've been happy, really. I mean, even though they beat Montreal, that wasn't a great game. Um, I think the Vegas game, they looked really good. The Colorado game, they didn't. So I think that this is this is the way that we know the Flames can play when they're playing well. Yeah, and... You know, like, this is a team that's going to be a likely bottom 10 team. They're, even when they play well, you're when you're playing against good teams, you're likely coming out on the losing side of it. And, yeah. you know, you just have to take solace in the fact that they actually hung with them through the first 55 minutes and, you know, uh, made it an interesting game and, until it got away from them. Jacob Markstrom's first game back after injury in this one. What did you think of him in net? A uh, typical Markstrom performance. I didn't think he did anything particularly bad, and like none of the goals were his fault. I was kind of um, surprised. I expect him to kind of take a you know maybe a half step backwards coming back from an injury. I think the fact the Flames did so much time off this week maybe that's what helped him. Yeah, and realistically. Yeah, you know, like the first goal, like 45 seconds into the game, being a perfect three-way passing play to the guy that's literally standing yeah, that wasn't right, his fault. you know, like wide open in front of the net. And he almost got a stick on it, too. So, you know, it's just one of those kind of games. And, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> that's probably the best way to look at it there, right? I mean, the Flames, I think, don't necessarily need the win in any of these games, but... You know, would have been nice just for the rivalry reasons. Um, and, yeah, and an interesting tidbit, uh, Elias Lindholm becomes the first player in Canucks history to score against and for their team in the same season. Because uh, the first game of the year, uh, he scored against them, and then, uh, yeah, last night he got the empty netter. So. 
There you Just go. a weird little quirk of uh, history. I don't know if the Flames have any players like that. I don't know. We'll but, have to look it up. Yeah. Well, after those two games, the Flames now sit in number five in the wild card race. Obviously, the wild card spots held by Nashville with 88 points, Vegas with 83 points. St. Louis is uh, right under them at 79. Then Minnesota, 77. Then the Calgary Flames have 69 games played, 33 wins, 31 losses, five overtime losses for a total of 71 points. And Seattle at 69 right behind them. So um, tough slog to get in at this point. Yeah, it's realistically it's done. It's like done. there's no, no getting, you know, leapfrogging twelve points in thirteen games. Like the Flames would be lucky to get twelve points in thirteen games, um, let alone you know making up ground yeah. on Vegas. Like, um, you know, Saint, and, and Saint I hear Louis so- might make it uh, instead of Vegas because they're making a real push, but. Yeah, time's getting short for everybody. I think that there would be some big changes happening in Vegas if they don't make the playoffs. I agree. You know, and I'm hearing a lot of fans now, as I think we all know the Flames are out, who are saying, you know, maybe the Flames should start losing or start tanking, and I hate that word and that mentality. Have you seen what the PWHL, the Women's League, is doing with their uh, sort of standings once you're out of the playoffs? If I recall correctly, uh, the draft pick is... uh Based on the amount of points you accumulate after you've been eliminated. Exactly, yeah. So it gives you that incentive that once you're eliminated, to keep playing hard because the first pick goes to the team that accumulates the most points after they're eliminated. And, you know, it's new, it's radical, it's different. I don't know if it would work in the NHL, but I like the sentiment. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's going to be some bad teams that are always going to be bad in that case when you have a league of 32 like like the NHL. Yeah, like you're going to have the San Jose Sharks and the Chicago Blackhawks and the Anaheim Ducks that are just, you know, like they've each got like one decent player. (laughs) But, you know, those teams then might go deadline shopping too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you could easily start seeing like teams throw like a seventh round pick at, you know, insert miscellaneous uh, fourth line forward here on an expiring just to I think in that case you're going to see a lot less big deals done at the deadline because everybody's going to try and keep what they have or upgrade what they have yeah Um, but it's it's a neat idea and and I was kind of thinking about that today as I was thinking about the flames and you know now that they're I mean they're not mathematically out but realistically they're out Um, you know it would be kind of interesting to give them that that pick to play for yeah And, well, the Flames, um, realistically, like, they're not going to fall into the bottom seven. No. Um, Like, Columbus, Montreal, Ottawa, and Arizona are all a tier below the Flames. Uh, But Seattle, Pittsburgh, and Buffalo, who are the three teams immediately behind us, are all within two points. And it's fairly likely that the Flames, as, you know, like, none of those teams lost their entire defense core, basically. Uh, so, you know, like the Flames will probably end up falling down past those three teams at the minimum yeah. just by playing the game. So it's not going to be outright tanking. Nope. It's just the talent level is just not there. It's very true. And uh, thankfully, you know, talking to talent, Markstrom back, which is good to see. But the Flames lose Dan Vladar for the rest of the season due to a hip surgery. That's a nasty surgery. That's a tough one, especially for goalies. Um, it, you know, we didn't. I was looking back at some old clips, and maybe you could tell Vladar was having some hip issues. But I guess my question to you, Matt, is: Well, I have a couple. So first off, with Vladar out, Wolf is up right now. Do you think that we see Wolf in the NHL for the rest of the season? Yeah, uh, I don't see unless Wolf himself gets hurt. Uh, he's here for the rest of the year. I heard somebody on uh, on, I think it was on the Reddit or uh, something for the Flames, who was saying they should send Wolf down, play Markstrom, and at that point just go with one of the backups like um, Dansk or yeah Dansk. Yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah, but you could, but you, um, yeah, at this point, uh, realistically, Wolf is available and eligible for the playoffs if the Wranglers get there. Yep. And so he's going to be down there at the end of the year anyway. Mm-hmm. So, well, and I guess the only thing is, the if the, and I think the thought there was if they get there, and that might help them solidify their spot. 
Yes, and. And I think for his development uh, as a player that it's better for him to be getting NHL minutes. I totally agree uh, with you. Because he's pretty much done with the AHL anyway, and it, he would just be there for the a playoff run if they do qualify. You and I talked last week about how we would split up the three goaltenders workload. Now that you're down to Markstrom and Wolf, which... I'll be honest, I think was probably going to, in a lot of people's mind, be the pairing next year anyways. How do you split up the workload between these two? Uh, 50-50. I think uh, five, six games each and, you know, just alternate basically. Um, I don't see any need to play marks from a ton. Um you're not gaining like, anything I by think, playing Markstrom. Yeah, like, and like I we talked it, about last week, you could actually do yourself harm if he were to get hurt and you're trying to flip him. Yeah, uh, that's why I'm figuring some games because, you know, just to show that, hey, he's actually healthy. But, you know, they need to also get Wolf in as many games as possible. Yeah, I think I would probably play uh, Wolf. I think 50-50 sounds good, but I think at the same time, if Wolf's getting hot, I would leave Wolf in. I agree. Like, you know, and you might even do a win till you lose scenario at this point, or play till you lose scenario at this point. Yeah, which I could see as well. wouldn't be opposed to either, you know, and it's one of those where, yeah. like, at least, frankly, uh, at least current, maybe play till you lose for Wolf. Yeah. And then try to alternate again. Like, you know, because you could have Markstrom win four or five in a row. He doesn't really need that, but maybe it's, okay, Wolf, we'll put you in. If you win it, we'll put you in again. Put you in. Okay, now Markstrom goes in, solidifies things, then we'll put you in again the next game. Yeah, and realistically, of the current players in the organization, uh, Dustin Wolf is the most important player to succeed mm -hmm. uh, and doing what's right for him moving yeah. forward. Um, like, there are some players that, like, we haven't drafted yet or acquired yet that will also be very important to moving this team into the next generation of players. But, uh, you know, for what's currently on the team, like, he is a vital component of this team and their success moving forward. So doing what's best for him, uh, in my mind, is priority number one, two, three, and four. Yeah, and I mean, you know, right now playing Markstrom is not going to help the team at all. You're not gaining anything from doing that, and you're gaining a lot from playing Wolf. So, you know, while Markstrom pride-wise might say I'm the starter I want to go, I think if you're going to play one guy more than the other, it's got to be Wolf. I agree. You know, I think 50-50 is the least you can play Wolf going forward from here. Yeah, and it, realistically, like, it makes no sense to, like, especially, like, tonight, uh, with uh, the, being a back-to-back, -back for sure, Wolf should be in there and, you know, mm -hmm. play it by ear at that point. I see Wolf in tonight against uh, the Sabres. I would play Wolf against Chicago. Yeah, I'd play, just keep it up. Yeah, I'd yeah. probably play Markstrom against uh, the Blues because that could have point implications maybe i'd probably play um yeah i i mean it depends you've got a lot of bottom teams here and in in uh, april the flames are going on their road trip to california like i could see wolf playing you know two of the three there especially when it's the sharks and the ducks yeah so i think you've got to give wolf at least 50 percent of the games and like you said, he's an important piece to know whether he can do this or not. And we've seen him for a couple games, but I think also just getting him some regular work at the NHL level. We've seen a lot of goalies who come up, look good for two or three games here and there, but can't, you know, do Cut the it. regular yeah. work. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he also needs to know, like, come training camp next year, what he needs to do to cement himself as an NHL goaltender. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it... The more that he can do, the better he will be next year. And so um, the more lessons he can learn in each game is a teaching tool for him. Yeah, and, and especially when you and I, I think especially when you've got marks from sitting on the bench, I think it takes something. I mean, I'm not an NHL goaltender, obviously, but I think there's something mental there to know if this goes wrong. Marky's right there. Yeah. If I have a bad night, that's OK. Marky can come bail, bail us out. Exactly, and realistically, you know, like, as much as it's painful to say, like, none of these games actually matter or worth a hill of beans. So it doesn't matter if, like, the Flames lose every game 9 nothing. 
you know, like I ideally you do not want to see that, but you know, like there's it's gonna make the next couple of weeks very rough for us, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, how about them demon? <laughs> uh, demon where? <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean. Like it does not matter, and. Uh, in terms of the actual results mm. of the game. And and that's why I think you've got to give... And I think maybe even some of the challenging games. Don't just give Wolf the easy games. Give him, you know, one of the hard teams. And, you know, maybe one of the teams like Winnipeg in a playoff race and see how he does against a good NHL team. Yeah, and, you know, and it's also a very important thing for all the young defensemen that have been acquired as well to you know, give them opportunities to try and take that next step so they can learn for next year as well. Because, uh, you know, as much as uh, there are options available in the off season, likely the Flames are going to be running some combination of those young defensemen next year. Um, so, you know, like they need to also learn how to play like top four minutes, top six yeah. minutes. And I think regular. also learning like every goalie is a little bit different. I think there's something to be said about learning how to play in front of your goaltender. Exactly. And like, we've seen like when uh, new players are added, like Mackenzie Weger last year, he struggled for the first two months of the season. And then he was good after that. And he's been great this year. And, you know, Dougie Hamilton, when we got him, it was the same thing. And, you know, like TJ Brody, when he first came up to the Flames, was a complete tire fire for the first few months. Then he got used to playing our system and was fine. And it's one of those where, you know, when you basically have replaced two-thirds of your defense core plus your spare defensemen with new people, like, everybody's learning on the fly and... You know, it's not surprising that everybody's struggling, but, you know, the more lessons that for them that can be learned so that way they can start off next year playing effectively uh, will do a lot of benefit for them developmentally and for the team next season. Well, going back to the goaltenders, do you think now that this makes Dan Vladar untradeable in the offseason? Like, if I'm a GM and there's a guy who's coming off a, a hip surgery, a big big thing for a goaltender who you don't know how he's going to fare. You haven't seen him play. I'm not going to want to acquire that guy. No, and realistically, uh, Vladar, uh, by and large, is n not movable. Like, we saw when Kari Ramo got hurt uh, at the end of his Flames career um, that, like, nobody signed him the mm -hmm. following season, even though he was a respectably decent uh, NHL quality goaltender and he had to end up going to Europe and the Flames do have him under contract so you will see him on the team next year for some stretch of time but like unless you're paying somebody to take him like here's a second or a third round draft pick to just you know move the two million dollars which makes zero logistical sense anyway like Vladar will be a part of the opening day lineup next year and that's fine and you know like it doesn't really impact the flames choices either frankly uh because one way or another like they're going to have to uh have um a good opportunity to move marks from regardless of what vladar's situation is and you know then you have free agency to add a veteran guy like a james reimer type you know, filler guy as an insurance in case Ladar can't go or is struggling to that extent. What do you think the the Flames are going to have cap room? What do you think the chance is that Dan Vladar plays more games next year with the Wranglers than the Flames? Uh, about 50-50. I, I, I could see him start on the Wranglers because they don't know what they've got there. I mean, I think he'll clear waivers no problem because nobody wants to touch the hip injury. Yeah, especially with the... It, Again, that depends on how his uh, training camp goes, and that's why he had the surgery early, so he could be good for the start of training camp. And yeah, even with that money, his... I don't know that anyone else is going to want to take him. No, but uh, it, it's one of those that, like, if he plays well in training camp, then he'll stay with the Flames. If he, 
you know, is giving up seven, eight goals in training camp like we've seen some goaltenders, then he'll probably get waived and sent to the minors. And see, and I think I think the Flames almost have to plan without him next year, like because you yeah. don't know what you're going to get if they want. You know, if let's just say that they do move on from Markstrom, then I think you need a plan for Wolf, and you've got to then find another backup. And you know, whether that's uh, a UFA backup, whether you trade for that, whatever that is, I think you need some veteran guy there. You can't plan for Vladar Wolf. If Vladar's healthy, great. It gives you some options. Um, but I, Yeah, you basically need to go out and get your Kari Ramo or Jonas Hiller type of just filler backup 1B type guy. I think you really need a 1B. You need a guy you can rely on because you don't know what Wolf's got. No, and, like, that's where, like, a guy like Peter Mrazek or, mm-hmm. you know, insert one of, you know, Vanacek or, mm-hmm. you know, Martin Jones or, you know, I could list off, like, 15 guys that are in that tier of not good enough to be a starter on their own right, but, you know, can definitely fill in. And, you know, that, I think that's how they'll have to approach it and basically have Wolf bat- or uh, Vladar battle with the new guy to you know get the one B spot with Wolf. Yeah, and and I mean if they you know if they do move on from Markstrom, I I think it it it's gonna make things a lot more difficult because you've got to fill that hole. I but I don't think at the same time the Flames are gonna be any more likely to keep Markstrom because Vladar's out. No, and like how would you say it's also about respecting the player as well. And, you know, like, Vlad- or Markstrom, when he signed here, like, the Flames were in contention mode. And, you know, he's also 34, going to be 35 next year. He wants to win a Stanley Cup. Mm-hmm. So, like, the odds of him even wanting to stay here are near zero anyway. And then, you know, you add all the drama from the trade deadline onto it and 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 it just yeah it's a bit of a mess and i think regardless marks from stop back next year yeah and uh, you know i mean we can debate that more in the off season i think you know if you're the flames you look at both eventualities but i don't think they're going to be more likely to keep him because vladar's out like you know no. i think you and i both looked at vladar's a good upcoming goalie and we you know maybe he needs the first half of the season in the american league or a whole season in the american league to get well, back to and, where he needs to be if his hits and the thing is is that um with vladar he has shown flashes of being a good goaltender mm-hmm. and good games where like he'll give up four or five goals but he makes so many good saves and it's like you begin to wonder are some of the bad goals being caused because of the fact that his hips bothering him to the point where you know, because, like, he's been in and out of the lineup all year. Well, bit. that's what I was kind of getting at earlier. Yeah, like, you know, you could kind of see when you watch some games in the last couple of weeks, he maybe didn't look like he did a lot earlier. Yeah. And I don't and, know for sure it's a hit, but he just wasn't moving the same way. Yeah, and it, it's one of those where, in much the same way with Wolf, you have to see what you have in Vladar, too. And, you know, if he comes back and plays well then you've got your goaltender for next year and you know having an emergency fill-in guy regardless is a useful thing because of how you know frequent both goaltenders for the flames have been hurt so you know i think regardless i think going with the three-headed monster approach regardless is a decent idea for next season yeah i think you you would want to go into camp with vladar wolf somebody else whether it's markstrom or not i think you need somebody else there because i don't think that's dansk um i think they need to go out and get another you know i think there's going to be a year when they need probably two veterans in the american league um so you you find another guy whether you sneak one of those guys through waivers let's say it is markstrom and they bring in Morazic. i mean if you lose them on waivers no big deal if you think you've got your pair but there's also always a market for a backup like somebody's always got a, a goalie well, hurt yeah, and you look at, like, Carolina, they've had Kochakov and Anderson and Ranta, and, like, Ranta's been hurt for part of the year, uh, Anderson's been hurt for part of the year, and Kochakov's just basically been there and in much the same way that Wolf is for us, mm. you know, and, like, kind of just running with the best of what's available at the time, and... You know, I think that the Flame situation next year is going to have to mirror what the Hurricanes did um in a lot of ways 
Yeah, I think you're right. And, you know, I think if the Flames wanted to as much as not ideal because of where I think the team's going to be, they can make the roster space for three goalies. Oh, yeah. And, like, realistically, the Flames are going to have, like, $20 million of cap space regardless. Yeah, I'm not even worried about cap, but, I mean... No, I, th- but- I, I think even this season, I couldn't even tell you who the extra forward was. Like, they because they're farm teams in Calgary, they're not really carrying extra guys. No, and there was no need to. Like, so, so unless that you're on the carry- road, they, they sometimes do. Well, that's but- it. And just pull a guy up for the road trip, but I think you could carry a third goalie because of that. Yeah. You know, when your when your farm team was in Stockton or in, you know, Quad Cities or Quad wherever. Cities or Omaha or you know any of those places, yeah, it took a long time to get a guy up here. So you carry thirteen forwards, seven or eight defensemen. I think this, if they want to next year, they could run three goalies. Yeah, at least to start with. Yeah, and you know, let everybody get some time and figure it out. Yeah. Like, and like, how do you say? Realistically, next year the Flames are not going to be competitive, and. You know, as much as, uh, you know, the desire to be a competitive team is there, the whole Sean Monaghan trade is hanging over (laughs) the flames where if they don't have a bottom 10 pick, that pick goes to Montreal. So it's not in our interest to be good next year. (laughs) So it's one of, it's a, a wrinkle there where, you know, like you're, able to do more roster experimentation where you normally wouldn't uh Mm -hmm. you know and having a three-headed goalie tandem uh makes sense just because of the fact that you know if you have like three guys that are basically equivalent then you can just yeah and and i mean let's just let's just say that Vladar, I think there's a 50% chance Vladar comes back and looks no different there's a 50% chance that he slows down because of this but let's say he looks the same as he does this year he gets hot he looks really good. Now you got another asset to move. Exactly. And he's a free agent at, at the end of next season, too. Just like Manjapane. Yeah, Kuzmenko, you know, s- somebody cetera, loses their goalie at Christmas time. They call the Flames, say, you got three of them. Please, sir, can we have a goalie? And, you know, uh, you move one away. Yeah. And even if it, you're only getting, like, a third or a fourth round pick, hey, that's an asset. So why yeah. not? Exactly. So we'll see what happens there, but I think, you know, as you and I talked about, we, we're going to see a lot of Wolf this season, maybe unexpectedly, and I think we've got to see Wolf in at least half the games from here on out. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't know what's worth doing. Yeah, and like realistically, just uh, commenting about next season, like the Flames basically all year have had Hannafin and Tanev and a Vesna caliber Markstrom throughout the the season and they're still the 11th worst team in the league so like this team is not going to magically improve right away next year where they're going to be vying for a playoff spot and like especially if they move on from markstrom like it's gonna be a rough season and like they're gonna be where like columbus is next year um more than likely like in the top five ish bracket instead of you know vying for a playoff spot so it's going to be a tough season next year regardless renew your season tickets folks you're going to want to be there i already did all right well you'll be the one guy you'll be sitting all by yourself yes (laughs) um moving on kids as as we talked about next season (laughs) flames have made some uh some signings for next season already Yep. They, they went out and signed a college free agent. This is something that the Flames, I think, have always done really well compared to other organizations is finding those undrafted college guys. And you and I have attended many a rookie camp, and especially lately where it's all college walk-on guys. So good to see them sign another one here. Um, yeah, and, you know, like we, we've hit gold on a few occasions, like Josh Juris, Walker Dewar, uh, David Moss, like, you know, they've gotten some actual. I mean, even NHL even non college guys. guys. Our captain Mark Giordano for years was a you know a walk on undrafted free agent. Yeah, so you know, anytime you can get good players for free, that's always a bonus. The Flames brought in Sam Morton. He's a 24 year old from California. He is six foot, 174 pounds, right shot forward. He's been playing for Minnesota State University all season. Signed here and has joined the Wranglers this year on a PTO, uh, or sorry, an ATO, an amateur tryout agreement, which means he's eligible to play for them for the rest of the season in the playoffs. He signed a two-year, 950 AAV contract. It was supposed to be an ELC, or an entry-level contract. 
Turns out we won't get into all the logistics of the CBA here. I don't think anybody wants it. The Flames got rejected as an entry-level deal. They had to re-sign this deal as a non-entry level. And the only difference, any player younger than 25 as of September 15th during the year of their first contract must sign an entry-level deal. According to Cap Friendly, every entry-level deal is a two-way with a maximum salary of 950000 So really, the only thing it means is you can't go higher than 950000 You can add bonuses. You can't in the second contract. This kid's not in line for bonuses. There's no need to worry about this. He's here. He's in Calgary. He's playing for the Wranglers. They're going to refile. It's just it's a, it's a clerical error. Yeah, they already did. And it's one of those where, yeah, like... Normally, when you're signing a college player, you're signing them for the season that you're playing. Um, and that's where the wrinkle was, because if you had signed him for this year... He'd be 24. It yeah, and it would have been the entry-level deal. There but because he comes snafu. in next year, he's over yeah. the ELC age. Yeah, which is not a big deal. It just uh, Nothing changes. Same of, money, same term. Nothing, yeah, nothing's going to Yeah, change. it was just a clerical, oh yeah, his age is slightly over by then whoops and you carry on like it's no big deal he's already here in calgary he's playing for the wranglers he's played three games for them wearing jersey number 45 uh, and three games he has one goal one assist and two points so can't ask for much better than that for a guy jumping from you know college into the ahl we'll see if he can keep that pace up yeah from what i've heard of him uh, basically like a glenn godan type where Kind of does everything okay, but, uh, you know, don't expect him to be, like, a full-time NHL guy unless he takes another step. But, you know, a serviceable top-line AHLer slash, like, 13th forward, definitely possible moving forward. Yeah, I think with the depth this organization has a forward, I, th I can think of a handful of guys who are probably on the depth chart above him. I don't see him even getting that 13th forward sniff without taking a, another big step forward. Yeah. And realistically, like I'm sure that he will probably see a game here and there, like they've done like with Cole Schwint um, and a few other guys this year. Um, like next year, I'm expecting the same kind of, you know, rotate any of your viable players in for a game here and there as injuries happen. But I would not expect him to stay for. Well, more and that's than a one reason too. I think Cole Schwint and um, you know some of these other guys are higher on the depth chart than him. If there is going to be a call up. Oh, I agree. And usually the Flames are good about getting uh, their college free agents a, at least a game in the NHL. Like guys like Bryce Van Brant to Bill Arnold. Oh, there's some uh, names I've forgotten you know, about. Yeah, uh, you know, like they're they've had a few guys like that where it's like. Oh, yeah, that, that guy played for us briefly. Wasn't and... Bill Arnold the uh, college line mate of Johnny? Yeah, exactly. And one of them went somewhere, and the other one is now... He a... became a, photograph, a photographer, like there you a go. old man. So. There you go. <clears throat> um, the other deal the Flames signed this, actually today, was uh, signing an entry-level contract for Yoni Yermo. This is one of the defensemen they brought over from Vancouver in the Elias Lindholm trade. Uh, Yoni Yermo is 21. He's... Finnish. He's playing in the Finnish league now, the Liga as they call it. So he's been playing top level hockey over there, as Brad Treliving used to say, playing with men uh, for at least three uh, since 2021 22. So this will be his, what, fourth, yeah, I think his third year in the Liga, fourth year in the Liga. Um, and they've signed him to a two year, 850,000 AV two way deal for that starts next year so this is a guy that i think you'll be seeing coming over next year as well yeah and that was the whole part of uh the trades for this year was to get that middle group of young assets on the blue line uh so that way there'd be some legit competition between guys like bruce davich uh poirier moran yermo kuznetsov soloviev you know ohotiak like all of those guys being in that basically same age group, same fighting for the same spots, and Yermo will slot in, and if he can earn a spot in the NHL, good for him. And if not, hopefully one of the other guys does. And you know, the I'm not expecting him to get an NHL spot next year. No, I would be surprised if 
unless like the flame he plays well and the flames run into injuries i wouldn't expect him to actually suit up at any point i think if nothing else we're gonna see as we often do some readjustment time needed as he comes over from europe and learns the north american ice north american game i think that's uh you know you're gonna probably see him struggle a little bit with the wranglers at the beginning of the year because of that and i don't know that he'll be top on the depth chart because of it no, and realistically, like, if he gets any NHL action, it'll be the following year, and probably, like, the same type of cup of coffee that Kuznetsov and Soloviev did, where, you know, game here, game there, kind of thing, unless he takes that next step and becomes a legit NHLer, in which case, he will have a spot, but, yep. you know. We'll see, like I said, I think there's going yeah, to be some, a, a I think there's gonna be some transitional see. difficulties. Yeah. I would not be hopeful that he will transition to an NHL player, but he definitely will fill a spot on the farm team. Yeah, and I think he can, you know, I don't think everybody the Flames are bringing over and all these young guys and all the picks are going to have, they're not all going to be NHLers. And, you know, even if you can have a really good career as an American League guy, there's something to be said for that too. Yeah, and it doesn't hurt getting an opportunity. And, like, that's where the Flames become an actual desirable team for insert miscellaneous unrestricted free agents for prospects because hey you have to beat out these guys on a bad team in order to you know earn your spot in the nhl and you know we don't have a ton of depth so if you're actually showing something there you can get time with guys like huberdo and Kadri, uh provided that you're playing well yeah for sure so I think we'll see more of these uh, deals over the next little bit. I mean, we saw, as you mentioned, Brustavich is signed, Yermo signed, Morton is signed. I think we'll probably see a couple other. I think there's a couple free agents we're waiting to be signed. I think there's probably going to be one or two more college free agents, even if that's not till after, you know, camp in July. But I think that we're in that season where you're going to start seeing a steady, steady stream of these little deals signed. Yeah, and, you know, Calgary's in that good zone where you know the opportunity is there for you to take it it's yep. also not like the flames have a ton of high-end draft picks that are you know like higher-end competition for like top line roster spots yep. like Hansik is basically the only guy that they would be competing with and so you know if they're a more flashier guy they might want to sign with a team where you know like the route to the first line is not exactly impeded by much of anything yeah and i think the flames are starting to also get a resume for being a good development team both ahl and uh nhl and that you know if i'm a young player i want to come into that as well well and you just have to look at guys like connor zari and martin pospisil uh as an example like they were on nobody's radar at the start of the year and like they've both cemented themselves as top tier young players yeah for our gm team. constantly makes it known that we're making opportunities for young players speaking of the gm did you read the uh, interview that he did with frank saravelli post on the daily faceoff this week interesting article we i don't want to read too much into it or between the lines but um a couple takeaways and we'll link it in the show notes so if you're listening to this on a podcatcher on the web. We'll have a link to it in our show notes if you want to go read it. Calgary will have roughly $19 million in cap space heading into the summer with only 68.8 committed. Um, and, I mean, that gives them some money. And Craig Conroy said in this article, too, when he, when he was talking to Frank Cervelli, quote, if there's the right length of a contract, if there's a need we have, we'll do it. It's hard to find certain players. Maybe to add a veteran or two would be something nice. We have a good mix. We're trying to let the young guys play, and that's still priority. But if we can find help for two or three years, that's what we're looking for because it's hard to make trades for certain players, and we still want to be competitive, end quote. So Conroy pretty much saying, you know, don't expect him to go out on, you know, day one of free agency and pay 10, you know, 11 million for a guy. But that you know, there's always that mid-tier of, of free agents, and it sounds like Conroy is willing to bring in some help, some support for two or three years to help shore up his roster. Yeah, sort of like how Ottawa brought in Giroux and Tarasenko over the last couple of years. Um, you know, and they filled a need at the time at, while they were transitioning their organization and, you know, were able to move on from Tarasenko and get a few things. Yeah. And, you know, the Flames realistically 
are probably going to be in the, this situation where, you know, whether they're trading a draft pick for a young player or, you know, eating a Monaghan type contract or, you know, insert that kind of situation here and possibly going after, you know, like the newer version of Blake Coleman or, uh, for leak or you know like yeah, that tier I, I think of you'll probably serviceable veteran guy i think you'll probably find the guy's early 30s who's maybe coming off a big deal or, or coming off a disappointing year and needs a place to go and calgary could be a good landing spot mm-hmm. especially if they're you know if they've had a disappointing couple of years and they're looking to you know if connor really wants to do a two or three year deal you're not going to be here for seven years or six years you know so okay i'll come in i'll play well for a couple of years i'll look really good because there's not a lot of good guys in this roster and then i can go and get a better deal when i leave do you offer Lindholm a one-year five million dollar contract because <laughs> honestly i don't think he's gonna get much more than that i think i'd let Lindholm come to me if i was the flames yeah you know let his agent know hey we're open to bringing you back if you don't see what you want in the market give us a call yeah I, I just, yeah, I, I'm. It's rare to see a player torpedo themselves as much as he has this year. And but uh, you know, I think it goes back to discussions you and I have had. You know, early in the season, even last year, I don't think he was worth what he thought he was worth. I don't think any GM thought he was worth what he was worth. No, and like realistically, you know, heading into this year, like to in my mind, like him and Kadri were basically equivalently tiered. And Kadri signed a 7-7 deal. And mm-hmm. so, like, if you're wanting a premium beyond that, it's kind of like, well, you don't really... Like, 7.5, sure, but... And I think know, Kadri um, came off a cup, and that's why he got a little bit more, too. If we would have signed yeah. Kadri and he didn't come off winning the cup, I don't think he would have got 7. No, it probably would have been a 6.5, six, $6 million or less. And well, I, I think the fact that it didn't get signed till late in the summer, I'm thinking, like, five and a half, six. Like, usually yeah. when you're signing that late, you're taking a big discount. Yeah. And, you know, like, Lindholm played himself, I think, and it just, yeah. I think Lind, I honestly think Lindholm looked good when he was with Kachuk and uh, Johnny Goudreau, and I think, you know, he probably looked like a better centerman than he really was. And we see that all the time, right? A guy gets propped up by their line mates, and that's what happens there. I know our friend Kevin Olenek over at Shifts and Pucks thought he was the best you know, center in the league for a while. I think he's a good second line center who got yeah. propped up. And when he didn't have those line mates, I think, well, sorry, I don't think Kevin thought he was the best in the league. I think he was the best two way guy, I believe. Um, I think that's what he said, but you know, I think he was a good number two center that got propped up. And when he didn't have those line mates there, uh, you know, we saw what he was. And now in Vancouver, when he is playing as a, you know, two, three center, I think there's, there's going to be some recalibration there as far as what he is, how he plays, that sort of thing. Yeah, and realistically, uh, you know, like any contending team is not going to want him for more than a second, third line center no. role. And, you know, those are the kind of guys, I'm not saying it will be Lindholm, but a guy like that who, you know what, had a bad season and got traded and didn't look good and needs a place to redeem themselves, Calgary could be that place for you. Yeah, and that's why I threw that one out because he kind of is the poster child of, you know, I was really good and then had an epically bad year and, you know, need a, need some redemption. So. I think from a PR perspective, I'm not sure you'd want to bring him back. I agree. You know, like, I, I think that, you know, if it's going to look like you're just rehashing if you bring him back. You're not actually moving forward. I can see the I can see you and I talking about it. I can see, you know, other media outlets talking about him. If this guy, the Flames are moving forward. They're just bringing in the same old guys again. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, but I, I think that there will be some vets coming in. I don't expect the Flames to necessarily go out and try to use all $19 million. I think they will use some as leveraged in a trade or something. But um, Yeah, like I could see them dump, getting dumped a uh, contract exactly. for like a one-year $6 million or something. And, you know, here, eat our garbage so that way we can afford, you know, and... There are plenty of guys around the league on competitive teams that fit that bill, sort of like how Ryan Johansson was dumped on the Flyers um, by the the Avalanche. And I could see that kind of situation happening with us benefiting from that. Oh, for sure, yeah. And I think if you're Conroy, that's probably, if I'm looking for a veteran, that's probably the first avenue I'm exploring. Because if I can take that and get paid to do it, 
Yeah, because why not? And, yeah. you, you know, you have $20 million. Like, you basically are the only team that can spend to the cap that has more than, like, 5 or $6 million of cap space heading into free agency. So, even with the cap going up, and, you know, you look at all the other teams, yeah, especially the ones that come close to winning the cup but don't, you know, and if they have a deadbeat contract on their hands, they're going to be, you know calling Conroy because like he's basically the only guy that can actually you know facilitate that kind of need for sure and even if it's not a deadbeat contract but one of those where we signed a guy and didn't get as far as we need and it, we were kind of hoping on the one year it would work out it didn't now we got to dump it um we'll see and and you know I think there's some guys out there even that are maybe older and not sure if they can go. Like I'm thinking a guy like a Brian Little type who he's 36. I don't know if another team's going to take a shot at him for, you know, he's making 5 million now. Maybe he needs a place to go and show, yeah, I can still do this. Talk about a player that I even forgot that was in the league still. He's <laughs> playing in Arizona. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know if he's playing actually. Let's see. Um, he's listed as a contract. I think he might be hurt. But let's see. DB. Yeah, no, he's not there. That's why you forgot. He hasn't played this year, so don't take that contract. Yeah. Bad example. Yeah, he he's been st out since 1920. Yeah. I was gonna say I thought he was. There you go. Yeah, no, I was just looking. I was just looking at the list of free agents. So bad, yeah. bad contract example. Um, but yeah, you know something. You know Mike Hoffman, I could see like that, or you know one of these kind of older guys who's always floating around. Yeah. Um. You know, somebody like that, I could see, yeah, I mean, we won't go into all the possibilities, but um, I, I think you'll either see them sign a guy who's like 30 and kind of coming off their big deal and disappointing, or an older guy like a Hoffman, you know, 34. That's why I said little, because he's, you know, 36, but uh, Perron is uh, 34, you know, or sorry, 36. Like, I think some of these guys where it's like, okay, they're older, they just want a place to play, I could see them coming to Calgary. I agree. But not little. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing out of this article that I think is worth talking about is Conroy really made it known um, as he says that he doesn't want the young guys to think it's okay to lose. Like, you know, even though that we're talking about them taking a step back and, you know, retooling, rebuilding, whatever word you want to use, part of the reason he talked about bringing in veterans is to show that, you know, we want to win and we're not going to tank. And I, I love that mentality. I know so many fans use this term tank. Tank, get the number one pick. I think this is the way you got to do it. Yeah, it, it's difficult because, like, realistically, the Flames are going to be a bad hockey team no matter what they do next year. Like, you could airlift Sidney Crosby into the lineup and the Flames would still miss the playoffs. Like, they're, they're not a good hockey club. But, you know, you also do not want to get in a situation where you become like the Buffalo Sabres, the Edmonton Oilers, the Florida Panthers, where, like, for years and years and years and years, you just suck well, and it. can't find your way out of the hole. Yeah, and that's what the tanking does. It puts you into a long-term perpetual hole. And, the, like, that's where, you know, like, it's tough because... Like, the Flames do need top-end talent. Like, they need top-five picks, regardless of, you know, anything that the general manager says. Like, they need that if they're wanting to actually compete in, like, three, four, five years. And the only way to do that is to suck. But you also don't want to have the mentality of, ah, eh, well, we lost this one because, you know, we played like garbage. Oh, well, who cares? You know, like, it, that doesn't help you either. And it's navigating that where, you know, like the game against Vancouver, as an example, like, everybody was pulling their weight. They just aren't very good, and that's why they lost. Yeah. And yet they were able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that team. And if you can keep that kind of work ethic, even though talent-wise you're going to lose most of the time, you know, you're going to end up being able to turn this around quicker because, like, even when the Flames were terrible at the start of, like, 13, 14 and that, like, they still had guys that were putting efforts in and, you know, were able to quickly add in guys like Monahan and Goudreau, 
and you know but like the work ethic from the depth players like the backlands were still there and it just you know was able to turn it over where the flames then became an elite team fairly quickly but you know like they need to, to find a way to do that while you know getting those bottom five six picks like they did to get monahan kachuk bennett Yep. Etc. It, it'll it'll definitely be a balancing act, but I, I think that the right idea is to, you know, to say let's go out there and not make losing part of the culture. Let's play the best we can every night, and if the best we can is a loss, that's okay. At least we put in our best best effort. Yeah, and like the fifteen sixteen season, like the Flames played, you know, gave it their all. It's just that everybody kind of just sucked that year, and they ended up getting Matthew Kachuk from it, even though. You know, like the effort levels were still there, they just wasn't the right mix, and you know, things fell off, and that happens. And you know, much like this season with the team, where like they're giving good efforts, they're just not getting correct performances from one sector of the team. You know, it it'll just be an interesting evolution, but you know, they do need to, you know, keep the momentum of you know giving it that effort and be like the young guns from the 90s were, you know, hard working, even though not very good. It's just walking that fine line of being too good to shoot yourself in the foot as well. We've got a game to go watch, so let's try to get out of here as soon as we can. The Calgary Flames and the Buffalo Sabres are just about to hit the ice. Um, and I think, Matt, that brings us to our weekly predictions. Yes. Uh, last week, I predicted we'd win them both. You thought we would win against Washington, lose against Vancouver. Uh, we lost them both. Yeah. Anytime lately I've either been too optimistic or too pessimistic, this team does the opposite. How dare so. you? Yes. So this week we've got four games we can predict tonight since uh, since it hasn't started yet. So the Flames play four games this week. Tonight they're in Calgary against the Buffalo Sabres. Then they go on a short road trip. Tuesday night they'll be in Chicago, a 6.30 start time against the uh, Chicago Blackhawks. Then Thursday, a 6 p.m. start time against the St. Louis Blues. And then Saturday for Hockey Night in Canada, they're back in Calgary taking on the L.A. Kings an 8 p.m. start time. Um, Matt, what are you thinking? Uh, I think they win tonight and lose the other three. Really? Okay. Why is that? Um, we play well against Buffalo for whatever reason, and we do not play well against the other three teams. So there you go. <laughs> it, it, realistically based on how they've been playing lately they'll I, I would not be shocked if they lost all four to be honest like chicago's not a good team you should be able to beat them but chicago's kind of the achilles heel right now because they... yeah well we've lost like five games in a row or six games in a row to them so you know like yeah we should have beat them we also should have beat them all the other times that we've lost and got our butts handed to us by them so it, you know, and then like they have Bedard back, so like we actually get to see him against the Flames for the first time as well. Yeah, it, it'll just be a. I I think that even though like realistically we should win that game, I, I'm yeah not confident. I'm gonna split the week. I'm gonna say that they win on the on the ends. They're gonna win Buffalo and L.A. They're gonna lose Chicago and St. Louis. I think you're right, Chicago. They just, I don't know. They there's it's a, just some. It's like Columbus, and it's, it's not like even the, a good game to watch. They're miserable hockey games. Oh yeah, it's like how can we fail more than the other team instead of playing better than the other? And team? they've lost a lot, to St. Louis lately too. Yeah. Um, no, and St. Louis is fighting for their playoff. Yeah, lives, and that's so why like I think they're, they're going to lose St. Louis because I think St. Louis has a lot more to gain in that one. Yeah, and Buffalo, I they're just like us where they're just bad <laughs> every year i have to remind myself buffalo still is a team because you never hear anything about them no exactly like they're still in the wilderness and you know like uh, as much as like the they have a good young group of defensemen and like they're going to be scary with how good their defense is uh they need to add a forward or six <laughs> to that team because, uh, yeah, they, they don't really have any scoring options on that team. Especially now that middle stat's gone. Yeah. I do uh, like that trade for both sides, though. Yeah, I think it's a good trade. Um, we'll probably forget about it in a couple of years. Probably oh, yeah. by next year, we'll forget about it. But, yeah, 
Um, I think the Flames, I think LA is a team that's on a downslide and they really don't have goaltending. And I think that the Flames, after two miserable losses, which I'm expecting not just a loss, I'm expecting miserable losses, um, like we've seen lately, you know, like 6 2, 5 2. I think they're going to come back and be looking for some blood in, in the dome. Yeah. So Could we're, very well be. So it's it's expected Dustin uh, Dustin Wolf starts tonight. He was in the starters net for warm up before the Buffalo game. Where do you play your goalies this week? Uh, I would probably play Wolf against uh, Chicago and LA. Okay, so he well. so Buffalo, Chicago, and LA. Yeah, and you give marks from the St. Louis game. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you give Wolf. Both weekend games, so the Buffalo and the LA, I think you give them one on the road trip. And just because I think the Chicago game is going to be more miserable than the St. Louis game, I could see giving marks from that one to try and keep them afloat. Yeah. But I, I think Possible. either yeah, I think either way you're you're gonna see Wolf, I'd say, in three I would I'd play him in three of the four. I agree. Um I think it would be a good challenge for Wolf too to take on a playoff team that or a team that's fighting for the playoffs and see how he does there instead of just lousy teams. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, we'll see. Uh, We'll see what happens there and we'll see how the flames do. And let's hope that uh, let's hope this is not the miserable week. I think it's going to be. Well, like even the wins, I don't think they're going to be big ones. I think these are going to be grind out earned wins. Yeah. It's not going to be easy for this team one way or the other. But, you know, it's a learning curve. And, you know, like the young defensemen, like in some ways they're making better plays now and getting a little bit more cohesive. Yeah, and they're not all young. I mean, like Hanley's in his 30s. Yeah, well, I was thinking more like Miramanoff and Pahal uh, than uh, Hanley. But, you know, like they're adapting to the Flames system a little bit better. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. And, you know, like the Flames are going to need all hands on deck uh, for the rest of this season to, you know, play defense, frankly. And, uh, like, you can see that, like, everybody is kind of having breakdowns all over the place. And, like, the defense has been, you know, even, like, the forward group, which is largely untouched, is having difficulties coordinating their actions with the defensemen as well. And like some of the players are losing their positioning, uh, like on the first goal in the Vancouver game because of just miscommunications between the forwards and the D men. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see, um, just lots of little things to look forward to, uh, as the flames learn how to move into the next phase of things. Yep. And that's that's where we're going for at this point. Yep. And as always, go Flames Go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.